you at Central Baptist Church. I know we got a lot of folks watching us live stream in Refuge, live stream Facebook, television down in Puerto Rico and other places around the world. Welcome. If you're brand new, my name is Archie Mason. I'm a lead pastor here at Central. If you got a Bible with you, maybe you got your phone, maybe you got our app. It has a Bible translation. Uh, let's take those. Let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6 in the Old Testament today we're going to begin uh, in verse 1. We are in a series called No Regrets. We've talked about no regrets with our time, our possessions, our money. Today we're going to be talking about the subject of no regrets with our family, no regrets with our children. And that uh, Angie and I had the great opportunity last night to keep our 11-month-old uh, grandson. And, uh, you know, I knew when we started having these grandbabies, uh, all of a sudden uh, I noticed around the house stuff was becoming baby-proof, you know. Uh, Angie and I have been empty nesters a long time. When our kids graduated from high school, they basically moved out. And so we've been kind of living in that great paradise, you know, uh, of life. And uh, uh, but all of a sudden, she started childproofing everything, you know. And, and I remember I was trying to plug something in the wall and have one of those childproof things. And I kept digging on it, digging on it. Finally, I got my pocket knife out. And I got down and I thought, no, that's not the smart thing to do. So I kind of backed up from that. But anyway, Liam came over yes, uh, yesterday, spent the day, the afternoon. There last night, he'd crawl across the floor. And he'd turn around and look at me. And he'd crawl across the floor. And Angie had stuff blocked off around the house. And he's like a pet raccoon, I guess, you know, trying to get in everything. And I told Angie, I said, he's like wearing me out. I forgot, you know, how busy uh, he can be. And, uh, but when he turned around and looked at me, I, I thought about, you know, and he would smile and Angie would go, hey, smile at Papa, smile. He'd smile. And I thought, oh, wow. You know, I, I thought about, I, I believe I'm going to be a better grandparent than I was a parent. Come on. Amen. Hey, you know what? Uh, I, I'm going to raise my hand. If I could go back and redo some stuff parenting, I think I'd go back and redo it. Anybody out there with me, you know? Uh, you know, I'd probably smile more instead of like gritting my teeth, you know, uh, when I was raising teenagers. I mean, stuff like that. And, uh, and we can't go back and redo the past, but we can go forward in the future. And I know sometimes I run into some peers and they may say stuff like, hey, I want to do everything I can for my kids. Uh, I want to give them stuff that I didn't have when I was a kid. Now, there's not anything necessarily wrong with that. I just kind of call, hey, be careful uh, with that. Sometimes people say, well, hey, I want to make sure, you know, I wasn't able uh, maybe to get an education. I want to make sure they get an education. Hey, it's not bad. That's a good thing. You know, you may say, hey, I want to get out of school and get their education with no debt. That's a good thing. There's a lot of good things in life that you may look back at your life and say, I want to do this for my kids. But but the most significant and most valuable thing, we'll call it that, that you can do is lead them to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the most valuable, significant. If you want to get to the end of life, and we are progressing quickly, if you haven't noticed it yet. We are growing older by the day. And as we get older, time goes by faster. I believe that now. And so I don't want us to get down at the end of the road and say, hey, I have regrets with my children. So, what does the Bible have to say about that? Well, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, three simple yet very profound principles that we find in Scripture of how to have no regrets with our children, with our family. Hey, would you stand with me for the public reading of Scripture? I know you just got comfortable and sat down there, but we stand for the uh, public reading. And I'm going to begin in verse 1. Follow along as I read. Now, this is the commandment. This is Moses. Okay, this Old Testament stuff. Moses speaking. He's at the end of his life speaking to the children of Israel there. Now, this is the commandment, the statutes, the judgments, which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you that you might do them in the land where you're going over to possess it, so that you and your son and your grandson might fear the Lord your God to keep all the statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. O Israel... You should listen and be careful to do it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey, which means it's a very prosperous land, is the idea of that. Very resourceful. Verse 4. Hear, O Israel, this is the Shema, or the Shema. Jews today repeat this statement just like this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. These words, which I am commanding you today, shall be on your heart. That means you meditate upon them. It means you take them in. You embrace them. You shall teach them diligently to your sons. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign uh, on your hands. You put them as frontals on your forehead. And you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Three very simple yet profound principles. we got to lead our children. Fear God. We're going to talk about that. We got to lead our children to love God. We got to lead our children to obey. Fear, love, obey. You do that. We do that with kids and grandkids. And those of you who are future parents, we'll have no regrets when we get to the end of life regarding our family. Let's pray. Father, 
Thank you for today. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, just to look into your word, to, man, sing, praise you, give glory to you. Lord, I pray you teach us. I know there are many parents here, many grandparents. Uh, there are families here uh, that are parents. They're fostering kids and taking care of folks. There are grandparents here raising kids. There are single moms and dads here. There are future parents uh, who are here. Lord, teach us today from this passage how to live life, man, to its fullest for your glory, Lord Jesus, to enjoy the pleasures you've given us on this earth, but to live life with no regrets, Lord, that we may be fired up, Lord Jesus, on you, and that we get to the end of the rope with our kids and end of life, and that we look back and we say, we have no regrets. We've taught them to fear you, to love you, and to obey you. Lord, if there's someone here who needs to be saved, someone out in refuge, someone watching live streaming, oh, Holy Spirit, draw them to yourself today. We pray this in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen, amen. Please be seated. Thank you for standing for the uh, public reading of Scripture. So, we we must lead our children to fear God. Now, I know sometimes you think the word fear, you think, man, that's scary. That means you're going to lead our children to think God's up there with a big stick, just waking and whack somebody uh, on the head. It's not that idea. This word fear we see in the Old Testament and the New Testament uh, is the idea of a healthy uh, reverence for God, a healthy respect for God's justice, a healthy respect of God's judgment. Uh, it's a healthy uh, honoring of the Lord God Almighty. You realize that God the Father, the Bible tells us that the Lord, the Father God, uh, that He is spirit, we worship Him as spirit and truth. And the Bible tells us that Jesus, He's resurrected, so He is in His resurrected body. He's in heaven there. And the Holy Spirit's here moving among us. The Holy Spirit lives within us. So that's the Trinity. But the Bible says in heaven that Father God is on a throne. And that throne has some angels around it, and they are always kind of in antiphonal, back and forth. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. It's back and forth doing that. That there are lightning and and thunder and flashes of fire and stuff coming from the throne and like a, a rainbow a color of all these gems surround the throne and he sets on his throne across a, a, a sea of sapphires like a pavement and he sees everything and knows everything and the God of the universe created the universe loves you and me that's amazing to me if you think about it now this is the Lord God Almighty and so we think about fearing him and to have that healthy honor him, that healthy uh, respect him. In fact, in the Old Testament, we see this all throughout the Psalms that the Bible tells you, you can Google it, that fear of the Lord is beginning of wisdom. There are several uh, passages in the Old Testament in Psalms and Proverbs that talk about the fear of the Lord. It's very healthy. We, we should have that as believers in the Lord Jesus. But it's not just an Old Testament thing. It's a New Testament thing. You get in Acts chapter 9, and it tells us that the churches in Samaria and like uh, Judea and those places that they were growing, they were increasing in size, uh, they were comforted by the Holy Spirit, and they were walking and living in the fear of the Lord. So this idea of the fear of the Lord, it's, it's not something old, and it's not something that's just New Testament. It's, it's like what God says. We are to fear Him. So again, you can Google that, you can see all the passages there in the Old Testament. Now, we have to model that. We have to lead our family, lead our children to fear the Lord. So Moses is there in the book of Deuteronomy. He is uh, teaching them when he says statutes and commandments. You got to ask yourself, well, what's he talking about? Well, he's talking about the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, and you can go back. We're going to do this in just a moment. You can see those in Deuteronomy chapter 5. And so when he gets into Deuteronomy 6, where I picked up reading, he's referring back to these commandments. And he says there uh, in verse 1, he says, God has commanded me to teach these you, verse 2, so that you and your son and your grandson. So like three generations of people. Now, ladies, he's not excluding you. Daughters, uh, young ladies, he's not excluding you. It's the idea of the family. But it was also, too, in that day, in that culture, and we see this even today, Jewish boys, man, they memorize Scripture. Uh, at this point in time, too, in our culture today, I mean, they're learning that Pentateuch, first five books of the Old Testament's going on today. So it was a big deal, teaching uh, those young boys. He says, so that you, your son, your grandson might fear the Lord God, keep his statutes and commandments. And he says this, because it will prolong your life and things will go well for you. Now, the world today in the United States of America, many people lose their minds whenever they see a piece of wood or a piece of concrete or a piece of marble that has the Ten Commandments written on them. I'm talking about it's like their head is going to explode. I mean, they start getting emotional. They start hyperventilating. They are so offended by that piece of wood that's on the wall. 
And it just, just drives them crazy. They have nightmares. They need therapy because the Ten Commandments were posted on the wall. That's the culture we live in today. Why in the world do people find the Ten Commandments so offensive? Now, you may be sitting there and say, well, come on, preacher, man, that's old school. Oh, no, that ain't old school. That's now school. Do you hear me? The Ten Commandments are not old school. It is now school. We're not talking about legalism. You know what the Ten Commandments are? They're guardrails. Um, I grew up in a flat country, okay? I love the mountains. I'm just not very familiar with them that much at all. But I, I like, you know, I've been snow skiing. I've wrecked, crashed, done all that stuff. I mean, you get going 100 miles an hour, I think you're going to die going down a hill like that. But why are there guardrails in the hills? Why is that? It's so your car doesn't like just go sailing off the cliff, right? Now, you don't, so Ten Commandments are guardrails, but when you go around a mountain pass somewhere, maybe up in Ozark, and they got the guardrails around the edge, you don't drive around in your car going, I hate you, guardrail, I hate you. Man, you're just, just kind of killing the fun in life because that guardrail's there. You don't need to be there. I don't like you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sue the state. I want the state to remove that guardrail because if I just want to fly off out there like a bird and drop like a rock, I need to have the ability to do that if I want to do that. Now, I know we laugh at that, right? It's funny. That's the way people do the Ten Commandments. That's why the guardrails. They don't like somebody telling them what not to do. So let's, let's kind of look at it real quick. Okay, the Ten Commandments. They're going to throw them up here on the screen. Here's number one. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Okay, now I grew up going to church. I didn't get saved until I was 25. I memorized these and learned it. Have no other gods before me. Very simple. The Lord says, I'm a jealous guy. So he says, when he says, have no idols, you don't make an idol. Man, I love football. Come on, ASU Red Wolves. We're both eligible if y'all didn't know that. By the way, just throw that in there real quick. What is wrong with you? I saw, I saw him up ahead. Was okay. Hey, it, it's good stuff. Okay, I love football. But football can become it can be an idol. I like college football. I mean, you know, uh, in that. So it can become like, there are things in life. But the Lord says, "I'm a jealous God. I will visit the iniquity of fathers upon their children." Boy, I tell you what, we don't like reading that one. You know, because sometimes as men, this is a culture we live in. We don't like to assume responsibility. You see, we live in a culture. We blame everybody else for everything going on in our lives. Oh, man, my grandma three times removed. Great, great grandma. You know, she lost her hand, and I'm just messed up because you didn't have a hand. Now, I know you think, that's just dumb. Well, it, you know, that's what people say stuff like that. Hey, look, it ain't your grandma's fault. It's your fault. Come on. Assume responsibility. Assume responsibility. And this is kind of in this passage here because you like, that's right, preacher. Preach it to our kids. This message isn't meant for the boys and girls. <laughs> This message is for us. We got to lead. We got to model the fear of God. Okay? So, he says, uh, here's another one. Third one, don't take the name of the Lord. God in vain. Man, I was learning, man, don't be cussing with the Lord's name in there. Don't be swearing by the Lord. You know, that's the idea because we honor him. We respect him. Observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy. We're designed to work six days a week whether you like it or not. We need a day of rest. That's the idea of worshiping the Lord. Honor your father and mother. So we got to model that. If you as an adult, me as an adult, me as a grandparent, if I don't honor my parents, are aging parents, if I don't honor my parents and model that before my grandkids, you know what? You can teach what you know, but you reproduce who you are. Ooh, let that one sink in. Do you say, did you come up with that? Nope. <laughs> I don't know where I got it, but anyway. You, hey, you may teach what you know, but you reproduce who you are. Folks, if we don't honor our father and mother here, how do we expect our kids to do that? You know, you can tell them, they're not going to do what you tell them. They're going to do what they see you do. That's just the way it is. And so we've got to model that, okay? Look at number six and seven and eight. You shall not murder, shall not commit adultery, shall not steal, shall not bear false, shall not covet, shall not covet your neighbor's wife and if he has a donkey or a mule or property. I mean, it's that kind of stuff. So apply it to the date. Let's just go this right here, shall not commit adultery. Okay. The enemy wants to tell us that, uh, well, you know, the Lord, he just don't want you to have any fun. And, and I'm the fun man down here. You know, that's what the enemy wants us to say. He wants to say, I'm a fun man. You know, you hang out with me. We're going to have a good time. And you just live for today. Don't worry about tomorrow. It's all good. You know, because, man, the Lord, he's boring. He's boring. You know, you don't want to be weird. You don't want to be some weirdo. You know, you don't want people to make fun of you. You just stay with me. Hey, by the way, everybody else, doing, by the way, everybody else in the Baptist church is doing it. Why don't you do it? Why do you want to be some weird guy standing out on your own saying, I serve Jesus when everybody else, that's what the enemy says, okay? And so the enemy, he wants you to blow through the guardrail. Why did God say that? Anybody, do, just think about this, okay? Hey, and there are good people who can make bad choices. Good people can make mistakes. Do y'all realize that? Okay. 
You can be a believer in Jesus and make a very bad mistake. You can. Why did God say that? Not to kill all the fun in your life, but to protect you. People stand and shake their fist at God and lose their mind over the Ten Commandments. I mean, their heads going to explode, blow off their shoulders. They scream. They get so hyperventilating, they puke and stuff like that. I mean, it's, a, it's just crazy. Why? And all God says, man, I love you. I'm just trying to protect you. The Lord wants to go, this is not old school. This is now school. Now, we got to model that. we got to lead our children to fear God. Do you, as a parent, as a grandparent, as a future parent, have a healthy fear of God? I mean, do you have a healthy fear of God? You can teach what you know. You're going to reproduce who you are. You see, we got to assume responsibility. Here's what we need. Uh, well, let me preface it this way. I'm, I'm kind of fired up on this. It's a few months out. You're probably going to hear about it. I could preach it today, but I won't. Well, okay, I'm going to say a little bit. Here we go. Uh, Blake and I at Paragould, Blake Paragould, Teach Mac, we've been working on a series for February. It's man month, okay? Man month. Come on. Oh, oh, yeah. Man month. Yeah. What is wrong with y'all, man? I mean, if it's man month. I mean, like, what, what do you mean by that? I mean, we're going to talk about men. Hey, do you want to see revival? Anybody want to see revival? Come on. You want to see revival? Here's what I believe. It's going to start with the men. Now, ladies, don't be offended by this. But the Lord in the Old Testament said to some prophets, he said, I was looking for a man to stand in the gap. Now, ladies, don't be offended. You are created. You are unique. You're different from a man. God, you, God has blessed you. God has honored you. God has gifted you. Uh, you have, uh, you, you just, you're different from us as men. And you know that? And we're like, men, we're like, praise God, you're different from us. Okay, you know, you know I'm glad Angie's not like me, you know, and, and that stuff. But he didn't say I was looking for a woman to stand in the gap. Now, we know, we see women used in the Old Testament. Okay, you can think about Deborah and all that stuff. Because a man wouldn't stand up. That's why. You know what God says? I was looking for a man to stand in the gap, and I could not find one. If we want revival, and we want the movement of God in our families, we need men who will man up, okay? Hey, man up and be the leader of their families, and God will empower you. He will, and I know some of you sitting there and you go, I didn't have that, Archie. I don't know how to do that. I, I, I didn't grow up like that. I, I didn't have a dad, or my dad was an absentee dad, or my dad, he's a good guy, just never taught me. I don't know how to be a man. But you are a man, and if you will submit to the Lord, he will show you, lead you, and teach you how to be the man he's called you to be. And oh, for all the wives in the room, you're like a hunk, a hunk of burning love. That's what you want right there. <laughs> really. You know, when I was growing up as a kid, I didn't get saved. I was 25. My dad was a manly man and, and all that stuff. But, you know, there's a part of me, I just think, well, that man, man that stuff in the church, man, that's like a bunch of sissies running around. Uh-uh. Hey, it takes more of a man to stand for Jesus than it takes a man to go along with the crowd. It takes more of a man to stand for Jesus than for a man just to go along with the crowd. We need men who will stand. Come on, amen? Don't we need that? Yeah, praise God. I mean, hallelujah. That's how we're going to have revival, okay? So, men, hey, men in the room, whether you're future dad, dad now, single dad, whatever, grandpa dad, papa dad, poppy dad, whatever you call, man, are you, are you leading and modeling fear of God? That's number one, simple yet profound. To fear God, to honor Him, to respect Him, uh, to assume responsibility. Here's the second principle. We must lead our children, lead our family to love God. Now look there in verse 4. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Here's what's uh, pretty unique about this passage. This is, Hear, O Israel. This means listen, pay attention. It's big time. They say it today. They say this statement today. Jewish, Orthodox Jews say this today. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, Jehovah Yahweh, Jehovah English rendering Yahweh, is our, God is Elohim. Now here, that is plural. Now God is so good that in the Old Testament, even though the Jews did not embrace this, that's plural. And all Hebrew scholars will tell you, it doesn't mean two, it means three. Okay? Yahweh is our trinity. Yahweh is one. You get it? 
Isn't that pretty cool in the Old Testament? That kind of slipped in there. Nobody really gets that. He, so he says, hero Israel. So he's talking about love. And then he tells us how to love him. He says, he basically says this. He says, you are to love the Lord God with your heart, with your soul, with your mind. So the heart is everything about us, okay? And that uh, consciousness and the soul and life, and all this with our mind, our strength, uh, to the point of exhaustion. So we are to love him uh, with our totality of our being, but to understand that he is one. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ made some statements when he was here uh, on this earth. And the Lord Jesus, in John chapter 8, these are known as the great I am statements. In John chapter 8, the Pharisees were really giving him a hard time. And uh, Jesus made a statement. He said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And they said, you're not yet 50 years of age. You've not seen Abraham. And look at what he said. Uh, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Now, there's seven of these in Scripture. Jesus made statements like, uh, he said, I'm the bread of life. I am the light of the world. He said uh, that I am the door of the sheep, that I am the gatekeeper. He said that. He said in John chapter 11, I'm the resurrection and the life. Uh, he said in John chapter 15, I am the vine. Uh, but he also says in John 14, 6, they're going to stay right here. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. Now, I respect parental authority. I love my sons and I love my daughter-in-laws, and they are good people, and they're believers in Jesus. I, I respect parental authority, okay? But... Now, I know all the English teachers room with, you're not supposed to do that like that, okay? But for instance, I'm going to teach my grandsons that God says, do not commit adultery. I'm going to teach them that. Now, I'm going to have a conversation with my uh, sons and daughter-in-laws, and uh, whenever they believe is age-appropriate time, they say, well, Liam's 11 months. And he was at your house. Like, Did you have that conversation with me? Uh, no, I didn't have that conversation. Okay, not age-appropriate. Okay, he doesn't really understand what I'm saying. But there will come a time when I will look at him, I say, Liam, let me tell you what God says. God says that you're to be a virgin until you're married. He may go, ooh, what does that mean, Papa? I'm like, well, I'll let, I'll let Grandma Gigi tell you more about that. <laughs> but now I'll explain to him. I won't be upfront and honest because here's what. If, if we don't assume responsibility and teach him, somebody else will. And they're going to teach him wrong. Okay? So I'm going to do that. But I'm also going to talk with Liam and Miles and Steele. There'll come a time and I'll say, hey, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. Here's what that means, boys. Boys, that means Jesus is the only way. And they're going to say, but Daddy. Or excuse me, they'll say, Papa. But, you know, so-and-so, uh, he said Hinduism. He said, you believe in Buddha. Uh, you believe in, in Grandma Judy. You get to heaven. Uh, Papa, that's what he says. I'm saying, I don't care what he said. This is what God says. Amen. God says there's only one way. Amen? It's only one way. It's through Jesus. You see, we must model for them and, and lead that way. We need to lead them to fear God. We need to lead them to love God. And so we have to do that. We have to stand up and take responsibility and do that. You know, uh, uh, let me, some of you may be a little confused this morning, so I want to help you with this. If you are the type of parent, my, my whole motive is not to offend you and make you mad. I just want to point out if you're thinking something that you're wrong in your thinking. So here we go. If you are here this morning and you've got an eight-year-old boy with you, eight-year-old girl, and uh, you say, well, preacher, you know, uh, I've been reading this book, and this book, this book said that, uh, you know, my, my son's eight years old. I just need to let him choose uh, whether he wants to go to church or not. I just need to let him choose if he wants to believe in Hinduism or Buddha. I just need to let him choose. Listen to me. You let an eight-year-old child choose. They have the propensity to choose wrong. Because we're born, we have a sinful nature. Now, you, I want you to back up. Some of y'all are like, I know right now some of you just got mad. Come on. You just got mad. I'm glad you got mad. I hope the Holy Spirit convicts you of that. And I hope the Holy Spirit helps you understand you've got to model that. So this thing about Jesus, we live in a culture today where the enemy is out there going, there are different ways to get to heaven. There are, guess what? The enemy's going to this place called hell. He's not there yet. I know sometimes you hear somebody saying, well, oh, it's a, he's the devil's hell. It ain't his place called hell. 
Hey, this is where he's going one day. He's not there now, and he wants to take as many people with him as he can. I mean, hey, Satan knows truth. Satan rejected. He, he refused to submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. He was cast out of heaven. He wants to take as many people with him as he can. And so there, there's that voice out there today. You know what we need? Men, we need men in a room who will say, Jesus is the only way to have life. Jesus is the only way to have forgiveness of sin. Come on, amen? That's what we need. You know, it takes more of a man to stand up for Jesus than it takes a man to go along with the crowd. Hey, I've gone with the crowd, the majority of the crowd. I've lived with the crowd. Hey, but the Lord says, I'm looking for that man standing in the gap. You see, as parents, we've got to assume responsibility. We have to model. So, are you modeling? Are you leading your child? Love God with the totality, okay? Of, of who you are, heart, soul, mind, everything about you. Because you know what? There are a lot of things, man. I, there are things I like. There are things I love. But you know, really, whatever you truly love is what you talk about. Really. Hey, I love Angie. Does everybody in here know I love Angie? Raise your hand if you think I love her. Really. You, now, you say, well, why'd you ask that question? Without me asking that question, I think you would say, we know Archie loves Angie. Why is that? Because I talk about that love for her. And I don't do that for some show. I do that because I love her. I don't do that to make you feel bad. I do that because I love her. You should know that. Do people know you love Jesus? You see... What we love kind of defines us, defines who we are. You see, we got to model it. We got to teach it. Now, here's the last principle, simple yet very profound. We have to lead our children to obey God. So it's fear Him, okay, healthy, healthy fear of God, respecting Him, knowing that Ten Commandments are guardrails. There are broken lives today because people went over the guardrails. There are broken hearts today because people went over the guardrails. There are twisted lives today because people jumped over the guardrails. Fear God, love God, obey God. Look at what he says in the last part, and we're going to have our invitation. He says, these words I'm commanding you today, you shall be on your heart. That means receive them, okay? Receive the Word of God. Embrace the Word of God. Believe in the Word of God. Meditate upon the Word of God. And he says, you shall teach them diligently to your son and talk of of them when you sit in the house, walk by the way, put them on a sign out in front on the door in that culture. I want to share with you a few statements here. As parents, we're stewards of our children. Here's the first statement. Um, the church was not designed to replace you as a parent, but to assist you. Let me say that one more time. The church was not designed to replace you as a parent, but to uh, assist you. And again, we've got to assume responsibility. Uh, we, we're going to honor the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to teach God's Word. If your kids are in uh, children's church today, then they come home with this, okay? This is just a devotion that Pastor Adam has put together and uh, for you to work with your kids. They should come home with it. They can come home with they lost it or something. So you can get another. Uh, you may can go online and print it out. But it's not to replace you, but it's to assist you. You see, we got to assume responsibility for our kids, and we got to quit blaming everybody else if our kids, you know, don't know this, don't know that. We're going to do the best we can and that kind of stuff, and we're going to teach, but we're not here to replace you. We're here to assist you. The government was not designed to replace your parents, but to protect you. It's not, God didn't ordain the government to raise our kids. God never, never argued, and we don't see in the Scripture, that we're to farm out the raising of our kids. we got to take responsibility for that. The school was not designed to replace you, but to support you. So as parents, we have to lead out. We got to lead out in the home, and we have to lead out publicly. Do you publicly uh, demonstrate your allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you publicly demonstrate that you're a believer uh, in the Word of God? Do you publicly let people know how you stand? Do you bear witness that you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? In the words of Joshua, chapter 24, Joshua 2, kind of uh, at the end of his time, he's making a statement to the people. He says this in verse 14 and 24. Now, therefore, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and truth, and put away the gods which your father served beyond the river in Egypt and serve the Lord. Now, he's talking about way back there in Egypt before Moses even let them out. Okay, verse 15. 
He says, if it is disagreeable, okay, in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. Now, parents, here's a challenge for you. You have to choose. You have to choose whom. You are going to serve who you are going to live for, who uh, gets your allegiance, who is your God, who do you follow. And he says, uh, whether the gods which your father served, which were beyond the river, the gods of the Amorites and land uh, you're living. But as for me and my house, we will what? We will serve the Lord. Uh, I love my boys. And they were growing up. We'd have these conversations, especially teenage years. And so... Uh, one of them particularly, I won't tell you which one. He'd make these statements to him. He'd say, Daddy, if you wasn't a preacher, if you wasn't a preacher, we could go to that movie. Everybody else going to that movie. Neighbors going to that movie. Deacon's kids are going to the movie. You know, the preacher's kids throw the deacon kids under the bus all the time. Okay? <laughs> deacon's kids going to the movie. They love Jesus. I said, you're not going. Well, Daddy, if you wasn't a preacher, I could go to that event. Everybody's going to event. Neighbor down the road's going to event. Half the church, if not half the church, all the church going to event. If you wasn't a preacher, I could go. I'm like, you're not going. Oh, daddy. If you wasn't a preacher, I'm like, stop with all that. He said, oh, it's a preacher. My life is terrible because you're the preacher. Oh, woe is me. I'm like, boy, I don't believe that wine and mess you're doing. By the way, if I was still walking those fields, out there on the farms, working 100 hours a week. You wouldn't go to that movie. You wouldn't go to that event. I don't care what your best friend's doing. I don't care what Deacon so-and-so's kids are doing. I don't care uh, what your cousin's doing. But you're not going to that, not because I'm the preacher, because I'm a born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and I don't care what everybody else does, but it's for me and this house. And I said, by the way, my daddy had a saying when I was at home. If your feet are under my table, you're going to be at church on Sunday. And you're going to do what I tell you to do. You know, uh, I remember I'd come home from college. And uh, my mom would tell me, you be in at midnight. I'm like, mama, let me tell you something. I ain't been home since the summer. It's like Thanksgiving. Mama, I was in three states last week. <laughs> My mama looked at me, she said, boy, as long as you're making the grades. You might have been in three states. I didn't know it. But when you're here at home, I can't sleep till you get in. So I ain't Cinderella. You're going to be home by midnight. You understand me, boy? <laughs> yes, ma'am. By the way, boy, you're going to be at church tomorrow. Mama, you know, I've been off at college. I'm a college boy. And I ain't been to church since the summer. You know, me and the boys, I know I got to be at midnight, but, you know, me and the boys, my daddy'd say, boy, I don't care where you've been, but when you're home, you're going to be at church on Sunday. My daddy wasn't a preacher. My daddy was a born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you got some little eight or nine-year-old boy telling you, well, I, I'm, I'm going to decide what I'm going to do. No, you are not. Because let me tell you how this works, okay? When I got saved at age 25, there was a revival service. Why was I there? I do not remember anybody invited me to buy that service. I do not remember that. I was not under conviction by the Lord. God was doing some stuff in my life, but I wasn't really under conviction. It wasn't like there was a voice from heaven going, go to the church, to the revival service. I mean, it's not like I heard that. I was in that revival service because it had been really drilled into me to be at church. And the Spirit of God touched me that night. I was not expecting God to do that in my life. Now, here's what I know. We're about to have invitations. I preach to these crowds every Sunday. And I get to watch people. Sometimes there are men and women sitting on the edge of their seats, zoned in, listening. And they may be believers. I'm thinking, God, you're doing something in their life. Come on, God. Hey, and there's some, there's some good old boys out there. I'm thinking, I know you're lost. God's about to get you. You know, that's what I'm thinking. You know, I'm like, come on, man, just let it go. You know, and, and then there are others I look at, and you just zoned out. You don't care. I know. I used to be there. 
And your kids may be like that, but you never know when the Spirit of God is going to move in the life of your child. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, here's the invitation. For some of you, you're believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to have to make some choices. Hey, are you modeling in your house the fear of God? Are you modeling the guardrails in your house? I mean, are you modeling, are you modeling the love of God, how to love God? Are you doing that and leading your children and teaching them? Okay, you're going to teach what you know, but you're going to re reproduce who you are. Have you embraced the Word of God? Are you obedient? Where are you not obedient uh, to the Word of God? Where are you not uh, listening to the Word of God? Where are, and, and when your kids see that, then you're modeling that for them. And Adrian Rogers made this statement. He said, he says, uh, we are not responsible for the choices our children make, but we are responsible for teaching our children to make the right choices. Isn't that such good truth? You know, we've all heard this. Hey, my mom and dad taught me the right way. I went crazy, okay? I rejected the Lord Jesus. But man, praise God, hallelujah, in his mercy and his pursuit of me, he reached down and grabbed a hold of me. Man, I say, thank you, Jesus, uh, for that. But, but folks, we've got to assume responsibility for kids. So some of you as parents, men and women, future parents, grandmas, grandpas, papas, memus, whatever you call yourself, okay? You have to make some choices. As for me and my house. Hey, you know what? You may stand by yourself. You, you probably will stand by yourself. You just need to get, you just need to smile and say, I don't care what so-and-so is doing. This house, we're going to serve Jesus. I used to grip my teeth yeah. like that. Now I'm a grandpa. That's mine. We're going to serve Jesus in this house. Okay, so this invitation. Some of you here, man, you just need Jesus. You're lost. Hey, you're lost. Man, you sense it. You know it. There's a separation. It's serious. This is a separation. Hey, just look, you've gone down every path. You just need to say, oh, Jesus, save me. Jesus, look, he loves you. Just say, Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, I repent. I turn away from myself and I turn to you. Let him save you today. This altar is going to be open for places of prayer. Maybe you just want to come pray for your family. Maybe you say, man, I, I'm not a parent yet, but I'm excited about it. I'm thinking about it. We're going to foster some kids, adopt kids, whatever. Man, I want to come pray for them. And, and uh, I used to lay my hands on my sons in their beds and pray for them every night. Pray for God to do a work. Oh, my dear friends, take responsibility. Let's be the men and women God needs to call us to be. I'm going to pray for us. We're going to have an invitation. Then we're gone. We're out of here, okay? So don't miss this. Respect this time, please. Respect the invitation. Because there's somebody here who needs Jesus. Father, we love you. We say thank you. Have your way with us today. Lord, I pray we won't hold back. I pray, man, there's some folks need some praying over them. There's some folks just want to just bow down before. There's some folks need to renew their commitments to you. They need to be restored. And Lord, I pray, just do a working here, Holy Spirit, today. May no one be ashamed of you. In your name we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's stand our feet.